<laughs> hey, tonight we're going to go over the practice of real estate. This is, um, they rearranged the outline uh, about a year ago now and took some of the topics and pulled them all together and put them into this. A lot of this used to be in regulation. Uh, now it's in the practice of real estate. You'll see as we go through here, we're going to see some regulation stuff. Escrows, fair housing, advertising, your responsibilities um, under, uh, this is kind of um, uh, stuff that you've got to do. Antitrust, and you see we've talked about uh, two or three things already. Coal mingling. Yeah, we've we talked about several of these things. A lot of this turns up in different topics, mm -hmm. and it all kind of relates, and you got to know how it all hooks together. Trust and escrow accounts. Why do we have them? What do we do with that money? What are the responsibilities yours, uh, brokers, everybody's? And here it is. If you get money, get it to your broker immediately. Oh, yeah. Now, immediately doesn't mean uh, at night. Uh, you know, it's nine o'clock at night when you get an earnest money check. You don't need to bring it to the broker at nine o'clock at night. He's not at the office, mm -hmm. and you go to the office by yourself. You're, you're just looking for trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an agent killed in Birmingham about uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. taking an earnest money check to her office about nine o'clock at night. And her husband's sitting in the car. What? Oh. Sure did. Robert killed her over a check. Oh my wow. God. Wow. The one who wrote the check. Okay, man. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I'm saying. Don't risk your life over money. Right. The Real Estate Commission, uh, we, they're going to let you off on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just dangerous. That's dangerous. Uh, but cash, if you get cash, don't put it in your checking account and write a check to the broker the next day because you have commingled right. that money. You put it in your account uh, and mingled it with yours. If it's cash, you bring it to the broker in cash. Uh, the broker's that next got, morning. Yeah, the next morning. That's fine. Next morning's fine. Monday morning's fine. Okay. Um, Would you be able to convert it to a, a money order? No. Do no, it no, no, no. Don't do it. No. Like you got, you oh, got, wow. you got cash. You take your broker the cash. Okay. I got um, to sleep on that with my pillow. Yeah. <laughs> Put it under your pillow and just sleep on it that night. And maybe, maybe some of that uh, good vibes will come out of the money. You have right. money dreams all night long. I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. The broker, once they get it. If they've got cash, they've got to deposit it immediately. Right. Checks are different. Checks can have a date on it that says you're going to deposit it on this date. We talked about that in contracts. If you get a post dated check, you write it on the contract. post dated check, and then the seller's got to sign off on it as well, saying, yeah, I know it's a post dated check. Mm -hmm. okay. Otherwise, you're going to deposit the check <clears throat> when it becomes a two-sided, what's that word? Bilateral <laughs> contract. Unless it's got another date on there that says after an acceptable inspection. You can have a lot of things. You can word it in there any way you want it. But mm -hmm. get the money to your broker and then let him deal with that part of it. Yeah, um, got that. Now, once the broker's got the earnest money and you've got a contract, now that buyers got equitable rights in that property and you can't just give that money back to either party now you've got to have them in agreement if the deal falls apart for some reason financing or inspection or whatever reason it falls apart you're going to have a special form that says both of us are in agreement that you're going to get your money back or you're not getting it back and both of them are going to sign on it Sometimes the, the buyer will want their money back like today. Give them money back. To, well, no, the seller's got to sign off saying you're going to get the money back. Because without their signature, if the broker gives the buyer the money back, it's going to be coming out of the broker's pocket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are rules that you've got to follow here. The mutual release is the one that says, okay, we can give you your money back. This money 
has got to be held in a separate, and the account needs to be labeled trust or escrow at the bank that has to be federally insured. Up until a couple of years ago, it had to be FDIC insured, mm. uh, which didn't cover the credit unions. Uh, now, money can be put in a credit union. Got to be separate. Normally, you're going to have an operating account, which is company money. That's where the commissions go in. You pay the rent, the light bill, and things like that out of the company account. Mm -hmm. Then you have another one over here that's called the escrow or trust account. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a minimum of two accounts. You can't put escrow money into the operating account. Mm -hmm. That's commingling. See, down at the bottom. I don't see anything on here about it having to be in the state like we had talked about before. Um, it's not on there. I, I need to add that because it does. It has to be in a bank with a branch in it's Alabama. In Alabama. Well, like here in Alabama, there are no Citibank branches. Mm -hmm. People can do business with Citibank here, but it's through the internet mm -hmm. or mail. Um, got to be a branch in Alabama, and the broker has to be a signator on the escrow account. The owner uh, can be a different person than the broker, but the broker has to be a signator on that account, customer of that bank. That's the only account that the Real Estate Commission is going to audit, is your escrow account. They're not ever going to say, well, let me look at your operating account, too. They don't, they don't ever look at that one. They just look at your escrow account to make sure all the money's there. You have to reconcile this every month. You print off, well, we use an Excel sheet here that says, all right, we brought this money in, this money went out, this came in, out, in, out, and you've got a list. And at the end of the month, you print the bank statement. And then you go back and, and check, okay, there's that one, there's that one, there's that one, and at the bottom, You've got a book balance mm -hmm. that says you've got this much money you're holding in escrow, and the bank balance better be that much. Now, in an escrow account, you can hold an extra $1,000 above the balance that you've got in there. It's a good idea to have at least 100 or so in there, because some people will give you a check for earnest money and then change their mind about buying that house, and they'll call the bank and say, stop payment. Mm -hmm. You put the check in the bank, and now you've got a charge from the bank where that check bounced. And if you were just you know, having your books in perfect balance, now you've got a negative balance in your escrow <coughs> account, and that's illegal. Wow. Wow. Okay, you gotta keep these records for three years. Um, and a, a lot of this, another thing here on, on this earnest money, this is confusing to people about the escrow, the earnest money that I gave you. What happened to that money? Who gets that money? Well, that money is going to be held by normally the listing broker. It can be held by either broker or the closing agent. That's getting more common now. Uh, but if the the listing broker is holding, say, $1,000 in earnest money, and then you go to closing, there's going to be a credit on the closing statement to the purchaser for that $1,000. Where does the debit show up? Well, it's going to show up over on the broker's commission. It'll have uh, what you should have gotten as the total commission, and it'll be minus $1,000 there. It's all accounted for on the closing statement. But some buyers just, I wrote you a check for $1,000, where'd that go? It's going to be a credit on your closing statement. Down at the bottom, uh, everything in yellow, you need to, to know what it means. Commingled means you mixed it with company money. Converted, you took that earnest money check and put it in your operating account because your rent was due. Well, we're closing it Friday or next Friday. By the time the check clears, you know, the, we'll have the money from the closing. Well, you put it in your account. It didn't matter how long. You put it in there. It's commingled. You wrote your rent check then off of that operating account. Now you've converted it to your own use. Now, if I'm mutual release, I uh, just covered that. 
Here's a little uh, synopsis um, in the Real Estate Commission's website. They've got these little articles that basically will break down everything that you need to know about pretty much any topic. This one's on uh, your trust accounts and these points we just talked about are the little blue dots here. And it says, it says trust money must be timely accounted for or admitted paid to the appropriate party. Trust money must not be commingled. That's mixed with personal money. It's just what we went over. But they just, they've got these every month. We've got one of these, you need to know this. And here it is. This is right out of the, the real estate law book. That you can get one of them there like from the uh, $10 or so. Um, but for the test, y'all probably don't, y'all just stay focused on, on these little, little blue lines right here. You really don't need to read all the rest of it. That's what's going to be on the test. This is probably the most common charge against brokers right here, this line. Failure to deposit and account for all times of all funds belonging to or being held for others. Then it goes on to say separately, federally insured account and all. We've already covered all that, but that's the point right there. More brokers lose their license over this blue line right here. Mm -hmm. Failure to account for all funds belonging to all anybody else. Why do you think that is? Because they yeah. don't. Need to. Um, I, well, they, yeah, but know. I'm saying, is it an oversight? They forget? They think that it won't matter? Uh, well, well, they use, it, use it for office stuff and either forget to put it back or but even if they put it back, they still don't be still accountable. Used it, yeah. Right. Um, I think this would be a gradual thing over time. Mm -hmm. um, you opened your business, and it it was okay, but then you had a little slow month, and mm -hmm. you still got five thousand dollars worth of bills you got to pay this month, and there's only yeah. three thousand in your operating account, right. and you said, "Well, I don't want to get evicted." And you look at over there and so, say, well, there's 15000 in this account. I'll get it out because, you know, we're getting a closing check next week and I can put it back in there. But next week, you're still going to need some more money. And the next month, you may pull off another 2000 Yeah. And you're going to have to figure out how much you're going to get. Yeah, you, before long, you, the 15 has gone because your business is going down. You got to wonder, why is my business going down? I'm stealing from it. <laughs> Next one. Salesperson or associate broker shall pay over to his qualifying broker all funds coming in their possession immediately. And immediately, that's kind of a gray area now. Immediately, is don't risk your life over it. At no time, if at no time for deposit specified in the contract form, then the check shall be deposited when it becomes a contract. A lot of times you get an earnest money check, with, you rarely get them with a contract anymore because you get the contract in email and a DocuSign. And it'll be on there that uh, they may have a, a photocopy of the check. So you can say, well, they wrote one, but you're probably not getting it right then. But a lot of them hold it now until after the inspection. And then they'll give it to you. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to give them the earnest money. Ernest gives earnest money to show he's earnest about doing the deal. And if he's really earnest about it, he'll give you a check today. Yeah. So yeah. the ones that won't do that and they want to hold it, well, I'll get it to you after the inspection. Then we got more excuses coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another one down here. Disbursement. Disperse to the appropriate party or parties any trust funds within seven business days. This is usually not an issue. Because usually you've already got your, your, your funds that's in the account. And once you've got the mutual release, if the deal fell apart, they want their money. Sometimes they'll show up at the door wanting it. They will. Uh, but most of the time you're going to mail it to them. But you've got seven days to get it to them. Last one down there, the qualifying broker shall not disperse any funds except pursuant to a written agreement signed by all parties. That's our mutual release. 
or it says over there a court order. Sometimes courts will get involved. You've got two people and there's a thousand dollars that was attached to this contract and earnest money attaches to the contract. It belongs to the contract until the, something happens. Either it closes or it falls apart and we're going to have to m have a mutual agreement as to what happens to this money. Sometimes the seller's going to claim it and the buyer just doesn't fight. Sometimes they want to fight. And then if they do, then the broker has got to just hold that money until they work it out. The broker can do what's called interpleading, and that's where the broker will take it to court. But then if you only got $1,000, by the time you do filing fees and get, get your attorney to go, because you can't go represent yourself, that $1,000 is gone. Yeah. So we, we've actually got some money we're holding, been holding it, uh, oh, probably six or eight months. They just, both of them dug their feet in and said, no, that's my money. And the other one said, no, that's my money. Put it down or not? Uh, this is only uh, 500 <coughs> and they're both claiming it, and as long as they're both claiming it, it's just going to sit, and sit, and sit. Uh, I can't give it to either one of them, right. or move it to my right. operating account. Mm -hmm. So would they, go to, would they go to court on it? Uh, they could, but there again, we're talking $500, and it's if you go to court, court, yeah, when you go to court, here's the way it feel. works. You step up in front of the judge, and he said, have y'all talked about this? And you always, every time, he goes, no. <laughs> and he's going to say, you see all those new attorneys sitting over there against the wall? Go pick one of them out, go back in that room, and you come back when you got it worked out. Mm -hmm. And they don't have no money. Well, that, what they're going to do is they're going to go back in the room, and you hear them back there yelling and screaming, and then you start hearing them laugh. So, they reached an agreement. And then he come back out, and what do you think happened? They said, so why don't we just split it? For $250. Oh, people will dig wow. their heels in over 15 cents. Oh, my goodness, I've got a little extra there. <laughs> um, different on property management and security, escrow money security money is being held by property managers. Property managers have 60 days, so it's here calendar days, after the termination of the lease to let the tenant know, here's how much you had in security deposit, here's what we took out of it or didn't take out of it, and here's what you're getting back. Uh, it says you're supposed to mail it, they're supposed to give you a, a a, their new address, but a lot of times they don't. Um, but if they don't, then your uh, responsibility is to mail it where they lived. Mortgage fraud. We've talked about this already too. Mortgage fraud is when you're trying to deceive the mortgage company. Uh, two contracts, or you got to usually you got to have at least two people involved in a fraud. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> If you're going to get it appraised for more because you, you're going to cheat them that way, well, the appraiser's got to be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, the real estate agent may be involved. The purchaser, uh, there, there could be a lot of people involved in mortgage fraud. You don't be involved in it. It's a felony to do that. Uh, most of the things that we deal with in these laws are class A misdemeanors. This one's a felony. Under the table, that's always illegal. That means, um, well, I'll give you a thousand dollars back of my commission if you'll use me. Well, if you're going to do that, you've got, and yeah, that's legal. As long as it's disclosed, everybody knows it, especially the lender, because it can mess up their numbers by not having that much money. But if you give the $1,000 back to them as part of your commission, it's got to happen at closing mm -hmm. or before. But it's got to be accounted for at closing. You can't do it five days later after you got your check and then give them $1,000 in cash. Oh, really? That doesn't work. Got to be what it says 
at or before closing, mm -hmm. and full disclosure. That's the key. Full disclosure. As long as everybody knows, usually everybody's okay. When you try to sneak it under the table, see, you, you needed, you've got to have another thousand dollars for the down payment money. Well, y'all know how to do the, the financing now to get some points and get them that money. Uh, but they said, no, nah, how about you giving it to me? Don't. So, scenario, you got you, you, you're the agent for your cousin. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. And <clears throat> that you you tell them you they did a lot of the assertion themselves. They found their own house. All you had to do was get them in it and so on and so closing and all that. So the agent says, "Well, I'm gonna give you part of my commission since okay. you did." So, but you still that would have to be full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Cause you know Ray Ray gonna get out there and tell it. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody gonna tell. Ray Ray gonna tell you. Yeah, somebody tell on you. Somebody always tell on you. It's always be your fault. Always, <laughs> yeah. Full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Everything's okay. Mm -hmm. It's trying to hide it. That's, That's where problem. you got problems. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else on that one? Looks like that's got it all covered. Breeze through that little part. Mm -hmm. wow. Fair housing. Uh, ADA means Americans uh, with Disabilities Act. Remember, act is the law and regulations enforce the law. We got prohibited conduct and um, some exemptions. <sighs> Fresh corn. I think everybody in America that has had this class has learned this acronym. Fresh corn. You tell anybody in real estate, fresh corn, they know exactly what you're talking about. That's an acronym for our protected classes. There are seven of them. But we use two words to hook them all in our head. The first one's familial status. And I'm going to tell you right now, spell check does not like the word familial. It'll put a red line under it every time. R is race. The little, I got a little E there, and down the bottom I got a little O, but the E and O insurance won't cover a fair housing violation. E and O is errors and omissions, which uh, has not been required here since 1987, I believe it was. S is sex. H is handicap. Now, handicap is going to expand a little bit, too. Handicap will also cover someone with AIDS. They ask you, I heard the person in this house died of AIDS. Can you tell me about that? No, I cannot. Because you don't know about that. Yeah, I can't tell you about that because they're protected under the handicap status uh, even after they're dead. You can't say, well, yeah, they did, but, you know, AIDS only lives for, what, seven hours, and they've been gone for <laughs> seven months. Yeah. Um, I, I had a tenant, um, one of the last ones that I leased to, and he had AIDS, and he, um, his previous landlord was through the AIDS, whatever, whatever that, and so I was like, oh, you know, because... Can I do rental verification? Because the rental verification form is going to be in the file. Yeah, that's fine. And but then it says AIDS Foundation or whatever. So you basically to a certain extent. you made a decision on renting to him because he had AIDS. There you got problem. But just having that file in there because that's who verified his rent. Mm -hmm. That's not discriminating against him. Well, we're Not that it's discriminating, but even disclosing the fact that he had AIDS. Mm -hmm. See, that's a, well, he disclosed it to you. Mm -hmm. And he only disclosed because, it to you about him. So yeah, he yeah, you, can't, you can't tell anybody. He right. did. It didn't yeah, you can't t he can tell anybody he wants oh, to. Oh, he did. He, he had you can't. Hmm? And you can't make a decision <laughs> on that either. Now, also under handicap, we have alcohol. Yep. If you are an alcoholic, mm -hmm. the landlord can discriminate against you because you're an alcoholic unless you're in treatment. Now, if you're in treatment, the landlord cannot discriminate against you. I've always wondered about that. What do you call 
AA, AA. isn't that anonymous? Yeah. They keep anonymous. like you have to sign in there and, and give your real name. Right. I don't, I don't know. Uh -huh. I've never said, hi, I'm Steve. And the whole, right. whole group says, hi, Steve. <laughs> I am an alcoholic. Oh. Okay, we got our fresh word. Now, down on the bottom, we got color is the first C. And even within race, you can have different colors. I'm looking around in this room. We're all just a little different tone. Yeah, a little different shade. Oh, all right, that's our, our other our little letter. Opportunity should be equal for everyone, regardless of these statuses. R is religion, and N is national origin. Redlining, well, I should say, uh, let me back up here a minute. Uh, Y'all all came in here, and everybody in the internet land's looking. We've got some fresh corn down here. <laughs> oh, can, can, can they see it? That one's familiar. We've got race, good. sex, handicap, and then yeah. color, religion, and nationality. It used to be fresh, it's kind of dried out now. Yeah. Just leave that there, you know. Whoa. Get that later. Alright, that's our fair housing protected classes. Y'all need to know this. Seriously, know this. And when somebody calls you on the phone and says, tell me about the neighbors. What are you gonna say? What kind of people live here? Yeah. Heard that. What are you gonna say when they say, Tell me about the neighbors? You're gonna say, I don't know anything about the neighbors. Well, you don't. If you want to know about them, go there and meet them. <laughs> yeah, make yourself available. And say, How many kids are in the neighborhood? Oh, no. right, well, I'm thinking that's gonna kick back up the familial yeah, status. Yeah. And they won't know how many kids. Well, you can come out here about three o'clock <coughs> and watch. Because when I worked in the, in the private sector, um, they would send shoppers out to see, you know, how we, would we respond to those questions when we would have a um, prospective mm -hmm. uh, renter. I worked for a new home builder, and about uh, less than a mile from our office was the fair housing office. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And I, I, every time I drive by there. And then they'd call you on the phone, mm -hmm. and you're listening, and then a little while later, somebody else would call you. Almost oh, the same thing, mm -hmm. but you can have the voices different, <laughs> and they're recording what you're saying, mm -hmm. and if you treated one of them different than the other one, mm -hmm. you get a visit. Yeah. And those people get paid mm -hmm. to catch you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is important to you, mm -hmm. your livelihood yeah. here. Redlining. Uh, this is a practice. It says red line drawn around an area. We talked about this uh, recently and used Fairfield as an example. Uh, a third of the mortgages uh, going to foreclosure in Fairfield. Well, the bank said we don't want to lend in Fairfield. But that's hurting two thirds of the people that do pay their mortgages. So you're blanket punishing everyone that lives in this area. And they drew a red line around it to show. We just happened to have one here of Birmingham in 1930. Oh, yeah. Now, if you look around here, they didn't use a red line because they didn't want to be. I don't know, red lining may not have been a, a illegal then. It probably yeah, probably wasn't. Probably wasn't in 1930. But you look, you look at the areas on this map. Okay. And you can see it's there's Inslee. Okay. Yeah. It's not it doesn't have a red line drawn around it, but it's all it's in red. dark gray. Mm -hmm. Look at now I got to looking at the map and I said, okay, I see the dark gray there. That's race based. And I'm looking down here. Oh, there's Southwest. That's West End and that area. They got that gray downtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, looks like uh, East Lake at that time looks like it in that East Lake maybe going through there but there there's an area right there oh that's uh, uh, north of the airport uh, what's that called yeah, Norwood. Norwood yeah in Ingle Nook so it's pretty clear on this map 
Great patch to the left. Uh-huh. 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 Where it's downtown. Where, uh-uh, where uh-huh. it's from Inslee, when you come oh. straight down. Oh, okay. Well, you see the E in Inslee come straight down toward the bottom. The top that's right. Oh, right there. Yeah. Um, um, Brighton. Brighton. Uh-huh. Oh, that's uh-huh. Brighton, Lipscomb. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you see how they did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They didn't call it that. They didn't say, we're not going to lend in here, <laughs> but you'll find out they were not lending in there. There it is. Um, Another one that goes along with redlining is called block busting. Let's just go back to this map and let's just say, um, where's Mountain Brook? That must be the green where all the money is. Yes, yes. (laughs) Anywhere you see green, I'm sure. All right, you got Mountain Brook there with all that green money. And somebody from downtown, it's their skin color's a little different. Mm-hmm. They moved over to Euclid Avenue in Mountain Brook. And yeah, they've been busting ever since. And after they moved in, the brokers around here started going door to door around there and said, oh, guess who's moving into the neighborhood? And you know what's going to do to your property values. You better sell today. <laughs> so you start seeing real estate signs pop up around there. That's. Um, block busting. Block, block busting. Mm-hmm. The Panic is selling, it's called. Mm-hmm. They're afraid, oh no, they've moved in the neighborhood and now the property value, I better get out now. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Next one, steering. Alright, we can go back to our map again. <laughs> Alright. I said, well, where's our, where's our office? Office is in um, Mountain Brook. Yeah. We got an office in Mountain Brook. That's where all the money is. Uh-huh. <laughs> all right. This, I said, let me see how many fair housing people I can get in there. I can get this family with 14 children. And say, race, they're, um, they're green. So they really, they don't fit anywhere. Right. And let's see, we got sex. They're transgender, they're alcoholics, Ooh. drug abusers. Yep. So if we go down to the corn, they're colored, they're striped. They look like a, a zebra. Mm-hmm. And we got, the, oh, we got all these things. Mm-hmm. Well, it just so happens there's a new community right over here where those people are moving. Because there's a bunch of them look just like them. Mm-hmm. Go to the yeah. same yeah. church, yeah. got the big families. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're all handicapped and they, uh, yeah, everything so that fits in fair housing. That's where they're moving right now. But they came to our office over in Mountain Brook looking for property here. And we said, wouldn't you be happier over here with people like you? That's steering. That's a pretty weird example of it, but that's that's how it works. You would be happier over here with people like you. Mm -mm, I want to be over there. Yeah, I want to be where the money is. Mm -hmm. I want to be with all the people like me, we don't have any money. When I first moved to Birmingham, I I, uh, I went went to this apartment complex, and the lady was just real chatty. And she was like, "Yes, and if you have children, we put them all the way at the back of the property yes. for their safety." And I didn't know then. I was like, "That was steering." That is steering. Mm-hmm. Good example of it. You'd be much happier with all the other children. Mm-hmm. I don't want kids around me. I got enough of my own. <laughs> <laughs> right. She didn't even have none. <laughs> okay, there we go. Got the steering. Um, fair housing covered. Uh, this is just where you can go on a site there, and they've got some flash cards and some little games you can play, videos you can watch about fair housing. I think we got it down. Okay. HUD Fair Housing Site. This is another video. Uh, this is about a, I don't know, probably a 20 minute video where it's an apartment leasing office and a man comes in, a black man, talks to the black uh, uh, manager and says, yeah, this is what I want. But can I, I need to bring my girlfriend by. Uh-oh. You know where it's going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, she said, oh, fine, that's She's fine. White. Yeah, she was. Yeah, the she next white. day the white girlfriend comes in with him and the, the leasing manager said, you can't rent here. Mm-hmm. You start rent, you, when you start, stop dating white girls, <laughs> you can move. It's a really funny, but we don't have time to watch that. Y'all can watch it if you want to. I'm going to watch it. It's funny. Um, 
You have a required, see the big red letters that are required office poster. Uh, we've got one out here in the wall on our little bulletin board. That's the first thing we hung on the wall because it's required. It says if you don't have the poster, that in itself is evidence of discrimination. I had a, a HUD uh, auditor that came to my site last year. <clears throat> she was a HUD employee, and there was one on my bulletin board. That was what she was looking she for. She wanted to see it, yeah. Now, I have been told, and I cannot find the law that says it, that you're supposed to have the little fair house. It has to have a, it has yeah, to have I've never there. found the law that says you've got to have that on your cars and your advertising and everything else. Now, it was in in our handbooks from when we went to fair housing classes that said, and I have to go back and see if I can find it for you, but um, because we had flyers, but some of our, you know, something we had done in, in house didn't have the house on it. And I read that it said it, it, it is a requirement. Yeah, that's, I've heard it, but you, look, you, you never see this on anybody's advertising. Yeah, but you never see it. So if it is a law, there's a lot of people violating it. Right. Now, you ain't gonna violate it, no. the um, mortgage people, they have one called a, a truth in lending or something, and it looks kind of like that. They're required to have that on their stuff. Okay. Uh, but we, uh, I just, we, we have to have the poster. Outside of that, uh, I don't know about that being. It's a requirement. Because uh, I had to print a bunch of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now we got some exceptions uh, to uh, fair housing about familial status is where this one's going to kick in. You can have 62 and older community and that means that at least one of the residents in every household is at least 62. Yeah, at least one in the household has to be 62. The other one is a 55 and older, and that means everybody that lives in there is at least 55. Mm -hmm. These are okay under the exception for familial status. Mm -hmm. ADA requirements. Um, we, um, let's see, uh, requirements. Wait, I wanted to go here. Do you know the, um, is it 1988 one year? I saw that on that poster for the Fair Housing Act. I thought it was. Is that 168? Um, I think it was prior to that. I'll just find the poster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll look back at it in a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, the here's our sign. Um, ADA is Americans, okay. Americans with Disability Act. And Ooh, 279. Maybe this wasn't the one I want. Uh, no, this might be the wrong link. Um, basically, it's a nutshell on ADA. Rule number one is get in the door. Mm -hmm. You've got to have like a public accommodation. Mm -hmm. This building, since it's a real estate office, school, it's a public accommodation. The public comes in here. We've got to have a ramp mm -hmm. to get them over the curb. We've got that. Um, you're supposed to have the spot painted blue. Mm -hmm. I think it was blue at one time, mm -hmm. but there's, I don't think there's much blue paint out there now. Mm -hmm. um, and that the doors have to be wide enough for a wheelchair to get in. Mm -hmm. Steps, you can't have the steps. They got to get up the steps to use some of the services in here. Can't do that. Bathroom doors uh, have to be wide enough for the wheelchair. Um, let's see, can't think of anything else. Um, but the rule number one is get them in the door. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you work on giving them all the other services that are available in the building. Mm -hmm. Uh, exemptions um, are going to be like if we were on the second floor and this building was built when this one was in the 70s or 80s and there's no elevator, we're not required to put an elevator in or build a ramp 
around here. I guess it would be grandfathered in, mm -hmm. uh, but if something happened to the building, it would have to be brought up to standards. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get back out of this one. That's so funny because I was just thinking, um, I was talking with the uh, fire chief about a situation in here town and McDonald's, you know, a lot of them renovated. Mm -hmm. And they renovated the building, but then they went back and told the parking lot, lot up. And I was like, well, you just renovated the building. Why are you messing with the parking lot? But the fire chief told my husband and I that their step from the mm -hmm. from McDonald's to the ground wasn't within that code. Mm -hmm. So they had to tear the parking lot up to make it accommodate whatever. Well, I was like, we, really? well, because really? now now that the building has been renovated, yeah. now yeah. it's required yeah. to, because at the housing authority that I um, used to work for, we tore out a lot of sidewalks for that very reason because the residents in wheelchairs had to be able to travel and have access okay. to the offices right. and right. you know a lot but of I different didn't, things. I didn't, that's mm -hmm. ironic. I didn't even. I was like, that's the dumbest thing. But now that you're saying it, it's like, okay, that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. that's yeah, so Any little thing can call it a suit. Mm -hmm. you know? The wheelchair can get hung up on one of the little things that folks been with around the world and they'd be on the floor. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Got some exemptions. Um, Religious organizations, private clubs, uh, they've been exempt from most of the federal regulations anyway. Um, places of worship, other facilities controlled by the organization, such as a school, daycare, uh, they're exempt. Uh, this, we're not going to go here and look at that, but uh, when y'all get home tonight and you said you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> Watch a video or right. something. Right. Uh, I got a lot of extra stuff in here that that we really we need to cover the points, but you can go here and get some of the background and why this came right. into being and you know what they're wanting to do. Advertising and technology. Okay, advertising. Practices, truth in advertising, fair housing issues in advertising, requirements for confidential information, and do not call. Uh, Alabama's got a truth in advertising law, but the one that we're really, well, basically, truth in advertising and our ads must be truthful, got to have your name as it's on your license, unless you use a nickname, which you have to put that on the Real Estate Commission's website under your license. Say, say uh, well, there's a guy in Homewood, um, uh, Johnny Montgomery, that uh, competed in um, Ironman competition like 40 years ago. Okay. But everybody, everybody in New I mean, he, Got gold records. I mean, gold, records, gold medals and all this. <laughs> Everybody knew him. Okay. Uh, but they knew him as Iron Man. They okay. didn't know him as Johnny Montgomery. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when he went into real estate, you think he wanted his name or Iron Man? Iron Man. Iron Man. So mm -hmm. he registered, went on the real estate commissions, and put out beside his name Iron Man. Mm -hmm. And then now his signs. That I used to have one of them. Uh, it's got a picture of him in his little running suit, okay. and it says Iron Man, and then it's got his name underneath it. So you can you can use a name that's not yours. Now you can't use like the uh, the, the Hoover Team or Mega Agents or Best Selling Agent. You you can't use your team. There may be 20 people on your team. You got to have at least one of them. Got to have their name on that advertising. You don't have to put them all on there, but you can't use the team name because the team is not licensed. The members of the team are licensed. So, like if I had a, a team of, 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 of here 
we would have to have one of the team members would have their name on there and the brokerage name has to be on there. So we got three things here we had to do. Truthful, your name, the broker's name, or the brokerage name. Three things. Every advertising, that's, and we're going to see here, um, let's see, let's jump, where is it? Uh, I'll come back to it. Um, do not call. Y'all see that $11,000 there? Do not call. Okay. Do not call. We are under the do not call rules, and a lot of real estate agents will ignore these and just call, call, call especially for sale by owners, because they can put their name out there, and they put the sign out there, and put a phone number on it. <laughs> That's not an invitation for you to call them and solicit them mm -hmm. as a listing. Now, if you've got a legitimate buyer mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you've read their, that's on Zillow, and you read it, and that's exactly what your buyer is after, you can call them and say, I have a buyer for your home. May we see it? That's okay. But if you just call them to solicit their listing, oh, I'm the best agent in this area and I've sold 14 houses this week. You need to list with me. That's violating the, rock, the rule. There is, we're going to get to it in a minute, but you can, there's a, a website, do not call, and you can go there and register your phone number. So if anybody calls you, they're, they're supposed to not call you. Mm -hmm. Y'all, we all get calls all the time. Uh, yeah, well, uh, right now it's, I'm getting calls from uh, Medicare supplement companies. Me too. And, they, and <laughs> I have not called them. Yeah, and that's yeah, one yeah. of the rules. You have got to call them mm -hmm. and ask for information. Mm -hmm. So if a customer, somebody out of the blue calls you and say, hey, I saw your ad and I saw you sold 14 houses this week. Maybe you can help me with mine. Call me back. Well, that's a pretty good invitation that you can call them. Now, once you've established that relationship, you can keep calling them for 18, yeah, 18 months. Even after you, they told you, you know, I'm probably going to list with somebody else. It's not so aggressive. Ooh. They'd never say that. They want an aggressive sales. <laughs> Uh, so, well, some of the things we can do, we can call to collect debts, even if their names on the do not call, uh, you collect debt. Uh, charity, political, because you know that's coming up for long, everybody's going to be yeah. calling you, how are you going to vote? I'm not telling you over the phone how I'm going to vote. I ain't wrong. Um, no. what I'm going to say. You got my phone number, you probably got my address too. <laughs> I ain't got that to, um, so how they know who you call it? I mean, um, if they do not call it, Federal Trade Commission enforces. How are they enforcing it when they don't know who you call it? All right, well, this one right here, the do not call list. You can click on this, uh -huh. and it'll take you to the do not call registry. Uh, yeah, registry. And you can put your number in there. And then I think it takes, I don't know, a couple of months for a dog get out, but the people that call and solicit you for stuff, they're supposed to check that list. In fact, they, they're subscribed to it, and they can probably just cross-reference all the numbers at once. But they're not supposed to call you if you have your name on the do not call list. So it would be up to you if they called you and your name's on there, I think the first time you probably better tell them my name's on the do not call list, don't call me back. And well, they then they weren't able to like the spam calls and all that. that we're gonna, yeah, we're going to get to spam, but uh, they've got rules too. Oh, wow. uh, but um, then next time they call you, say, I told you not to call me. My next call is going to be to the Federal Trade Commission gotcha. and report you. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Fair housing. This is probably, I need to rearrange this. This should have been back up about three slides. There are words you cannot use in advertising according to fair housing. The bold words are not acceptable. And look down through there, 
Uh, there we got a bold one right there. No AIDS. <laughs> no alcoholics. <laughs> no Appalachians. And no Americans. What's an Appalachian? That somebody lives in the. Oh, well, on the Alps? On, on, on oh, the high. Oh, they're the high all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. No bisexuals, no blacks, no blinds. Wow. Oh, all of the boldness. Yeah, all this bold, not acceptable. It says italics use caution. We got some italics. There's a yeah. Catholic. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, you, you, you're not really supposed to write ads like um, within walking distance of good Catholic schools. Oh, you can't do that. No, well, there you, you're actually violating two because some people can't walk. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that one's on there. No, no talking about walking. Mm -mm. Um, see no walking. <laughs> well, there's three more pages. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Wow. I just got the little snippet right here oh, on the first right. line. Okay. Uh, now, what is standard acceptable that we can talk about? I'm not seeing a lot on there. No, because I see you may have curfew on there. I used to have people ask me if there was a curfew. Okay, Dan, that's okay. Credit check required. I think that'd be okay. Yeah. You're going to expect them to check your credit. Don't make the quarters. Oh, I see the, the underline one. That's what's okay. College, no college students? Looks like that'd be discriminatory. Uh, uh, assisted animals is underlined. Yeah, assisted animals. Uh, we've got new rules since this came out. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a new one now called support animals. Mm -hmm. Used to be service animals. Mm -hmm. uh, service animals are one that has been trained for a specific task. Mm -hmm. It may be that the dog has been trained to, when you come into a room and it's dark, yeah. the dog's been trained to flip the, the light, light on. on. Mm -hmm. That's a specific thing that dog's been trained for. Mm -hmm. But then there's some people that have kind of pushed the line over to support animals. Mm -hmm. I saw something the other day of some woman getting on an airplane with a llama. A llama. A llama. And a pig. And a pig. And that was, that was, she said, this is, my, this is my support animal. Mm -hmm. And she'd gone on the internet and, and paid like $5 and got mm -hmm. a piece of paper and mm -hmm. says, um, this is a support animal. Yeah. And how a pig going to be a support animal? And that's a llama. I mean, that's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's still that's a kind of a gray area right now with support animals. Uh, they they're trying to pass laws uh, to where if you're claiming it's a service animal, it's not. You can be fine. Yep. Uh, we got all little side jokes. It always makes me nervous when people start laughing like that. And I said, well, I was standing on the plane because he can't sit by me. I said, he's going to stand in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> um, oh, some red stars. This must be important. Right. <laughs> Under fair housing, law says you can't make print or publish notice of any of these things that discriminate on our uh, fresh corn. It includes applications, flyers, anything. Down here also means the things you say. This is published, this is you're saying it. You can't, like they called you on the phone, tell me about the neighbors. Well, you're just not going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to be in trouble for just talking about it, even though you didn't write it down, just talking about it. Now, here's a maintenance, just a maintenance man that worked at the apartment complex. People walking by, and he said, uh, maintenance man said, only real Americans live in this complex. Mm. Ooh. What's a real American? Uh, boy, that's, yeah, what's a real American? <laughs> it's so uh, This one, rental office decorated large pictures of these white people. <laughs> Participating in the community yeah. facilities. So, so <coughs> it makes it seem like that. It yeah, you, you walk in here and you look around and say, well, wait a minute. My skin's not that color. I can't live here. I'm going to say, Steve, take my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, same thing. Yeah. All your advertising, no matter where you put it, 
It's subject to the same rules, same fair housing, same truth, same everything. Uh, they really didn't want to, uh, I think I've got it, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, this is on our Briefly Legal. I told you to go there and you can find all these topics. Well, this one uh, from looks like about last year, or oh, six this months year. ago, uh -huh. says, does license law require it? Require? What do you think it would require? It same same thing. It doesn't matter where you put it. Alabama social media requirements are simple. Your company name must be there, yeah. and your name must be there. It can't be false, misleading, or fraudulent. Yeah. Now, here's the, here's the part. Your Facebook page, and then like just, you've got the page. Mm -hmm. Looks like your, your header up there. You could put all that information up there because you don't add like pages to mm -hmm. Facebook. It's just one long thing. So if you put it up in the header, I think you'd be okay here. Um, got to have the broker's name or the brokerage name. Oh my goodness, look at all that red. Ooh, must be something going on here. Advertising. It shall be a violation. Shall be. He can give you the number. Fortunately, y'all don't have to learn any of these numbers. Violation. Be published any advertising which deceives or is likely to deceive the public. Any matter which tends to create a misleading impression fails to identify the person causing the advertisement to be placed as a licensed broker or salesperson. That pretty much sums it up. Mm -hmm. You've got to use your name at which you are legally licensed to do. to do, unless you go in there and put a nickname in. And they're okay with that. Um, there's a lot of people like Johnny Montgomery that they're known for something. Mm -hmm. And that's what you know, you're promoting. Because if you've got something you're really known for and people already associate that with good, you're halfway there. You've got a little halo on you already. Yeah. Team or associate can be accepted and won't result in a violation if the team or associate one, what is it, says, uh, yes, it's in there somewhere. I don't want to read it word for word. Uh, a license must be included as they're legally licensed to do business. But so you don't have team or group as a licensee. They didn't take the course. They didn't pass a test. There's a person in that group that did. Their name's got to be on the advertising, the sign, anything else. Even your um, directional signs, like it says, for sale, a little arrow. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't just have that. You've got to have the brokerage name on there. Mm -hmm. So they will know who put this sign out there so they'll know who to find. Oh, and you got to be a reason they want all this information. Mm -hmm. And that's it. They want to know who to contact if something's wrong here. Um, that's what you was looking for. If Sam and Sal is salesperson for a team and sales. Yeah. yeah. Got to be a member of the team. Doesn't have to have all their names. Yes, all just members. one that the real estate commissions, when something happens, they going to call that person whose name's on the sign. Mm -hmm. Hate to beat this up again, but here, here it is. As we're talking about using the company name. This is um, referring to the size of the letters on your advertisement. Up until about five years ago, the brokerage name had to be bigger than your name. Now, the brokerage name just has to be prominent on the ad. Prominent <coughs> means you can read it like you can read the rest of the ad. Um, an example would be car advertising, that little fine print they put down at the bottom. If you put your broker's name down at the bottom, that little fine print like that, you'd probably be in violation of this rule. I think you should have your name on the top of the card. That's who you're promoting. It's you. They're going to call you. They're not going to call the company. The company needs to be on down on the card or whatever. Uh, even uh, with mine, I put the company name. 
But all my agents, I suggest you put your name there and put the company name down here. This is just uh, the rules on that. It tells you how old this is. We still have MySpace. Is that still a thing? I don't think so. Is it? But when they wrote this, they were saying it doesn't matter what the medium is. You, the same rules apply. So no matter if you got it in MySpace. Back from break. Whew. That was a nice little break. It took an hour and a half for break. Y'all missed all that on the internet land. Yeah, we're going to have break at the bar. We're going to come back and talk about license and employer responsibilities. While y'all out there in the internet land, land right now, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the like button. And it's amazing how many people are watching these videos. It just shocks me. I know. Who's an employee, an independent contractor? Uh, what are the things that we've got to do and due diligence as an agent? Things that we really need to be telling our clients and customers. Um, the responsibility of the broker, the license, and what do we do about unlicensed assistance? What all can they do? And I think you all got that already mm -hmm. under the uh, barn sale. You all know what they can and can't do. An employer. Y'all all have jobs, I'm guessing, or did have jobs. <laughs> uh, well, in your jobs, do you just go in when you want to go in, or does the employer say you need to be here at 9 o'clock and hit the clock, and uh, here's your desk, and here's the things you're going to do today? <laughs> That's an employer. That's the kind of power that they have over you. Uh, but they also have some other things they got to do for you. Since they have that power, they've got to pay half of your Social Security tax. And um, that's a, a big thing. That's about 8% that they're contributing of your pay to your future. You're going to get that Social Security check one day. I, I'll give it now. I do too, and I love it. Thank I'm you. waiting on the second Wednesday. I get up that morning and open it. Ah, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Well, there it is. I can go to the grocery store now. For real. For real. For real. For real. You are not senior citizens. Usually they're going to pay you by the hour. Uh, or a salary, but they're going to expect you to be there a certain number of hours and to do tasks, and they're going to control you and the task. And when you take your breaks, when you do your lunch, uh, they're going to control pretty much everything about you. Um, you may get a lot of benefits with that, though. You may get a vacation. You may get a company car and a retirement account. There are a lot of other things that can go with it. More things used to go with an employee relationship than now. Uh, they're trying to cut all that out. They're trying to circumvent all those things. I know a girl that's a nanny. She worked for two doctors, and they got her a car, a minivan last year for Christmas. Yeah. And she got the title wow. with her name on it. Wow. Well, you know, I think that's a smart thing uh, for those two professional people. Uh, now, if they bought her a car, Maybe. it's in their name, Lively. and then she goes out driving drunk one night, who are they going to sue? The doctors, they got the deep pockets. It's in her name. They yeah. gave her the title in her name. I, I think that was smart. I wish I could find you or somebody like this. <laughs> you learn to birth those babies again, won't you? I'm birthing them now with my great grands. <laughs> uh, uh, this is employer. Now, Chances are really, really, really slim that you're going to have an employer in this business. You're going to be an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. And have y'all ever worked as an independent contractor? Mm -hmm. Any of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, this is what sets you apart. There, they were telling you when to be there. An independent contractor, uh, as many times as y'all been in this office, have y'all seen many of our agents come in and out of here? Mm -mm. You've seen a couple come in and out. Um, you don't see them sitting around here and, and doing anything. There's no money to be made here sitting around. You need to be out talking to people. 
doing things. Well, your employer here is the broker. And the broker is not going to tell you how to do it or what to do. We're going to train you just like we're doing right here. We got you from, you said, I'd like to get a license. That's what we're working through right now. Once you get through getting the license, you're going to know the rules. That's kind of like getting your driver's license right now. You're reading the book, but you've never <laughs> driven a car. You've got to pass that test first saying, I know what a stop sign looks like. <laughs> Even if it doesn't have the letters on it, right. you can identify a stop sign. That's what you're learning in this class. But once you're through with this, um, tomorrow night we start post license. That's the people that have already done this class. Well, we're going to train them next to, first thing is, we're going to come up with a business plan. Well, as an independent contractor, you really need a business plan because you don't have an employer over you saying, sit here and call all these people. We're going to show you, here's what you need to do first, and then do this. Put your money here. Put your time here. If you don't have money, put more time. It's like if you don't have money to mail postcards out to um, an area, you got the time to go put a door knocker on their mm -hmm. doorknob, maybe knock on the door and talk to them. Well, that's independent contractor stuff there. You will decide on your own whether you want to spend your time and money that way or in another way. But the broker's not going to tell you how to do it. They're gonna, we're going to show you. Uh, uh, I said next night uh, in post license, uh, we work on pricing property. Well, see, that's something y'all haven't done, uh, but you will be doing that on your own. Well, a buyer or a seller calls you and say, help me. You're not going to run to your broker and say, what do you think we should sell this house for? No, you're going to be trained to the point to where you can get that information yourself and then work with it and say, okay, here's what we think it should sell for, and here's my marketing plan on what I'm going to do to sell your house. All these are independent contractor things. As you want or not. That's a big problem with real estate agents. Most of us are lazy. So why we got in this business? We said, I can get a big check for no work. Mm -hmm. well, this was other job I had. They wanted me to come in and sit at a desk and call people and, and, and fill out forms. I didn't like that. I want me a job where nobody's telling me what to do. I got bad news for you. And this job, well see in that job, your employer, you got one person telling you what to do. As an independent contractor, everybody's telling you what to do. Your buyer, yeah, the commission, your buyer, your seller, your broker, if you're on a team, uh, you got the real estate uh, board down there that's watching. When you put an ad on there on the MLS, if you got problems with it, something wrong with it, you're getting a note from them. Fix it. So you got a lot of people watching you here, but you're still on your own. You can work as much as you want or as little as you want. The pay is. Yeah, it's up to you. The pay's going to be relative to your work, though. Mm -hmm. If you stay at home and watch Netflix all day long, or what, we you stay home and watch HG, what is it? HGTV. Yeah, home, home and garden, mm -hmm. where they're flipping the house, and you're watching that all day long. I know how to do this now. <laughs> well, you're not going to make any money watching that TV, I'm telling you. Well, now, Nichols is never falling out of it. You're going to have to take that knowledge and either go get your hammer out, or you're going to have to find somebody that wants to sell their house. That's all going to be on you. You've got to turn these rocks over yourself and find them. Your broker is not normally going to give you a listing and say, go see what you can do with this. No, they do that. No, that's not the way it works. Um, we get leads here, and we give the leads out, but you know, when I give you a lead, I don't know anything about the person or anything. I just got a name and a number. They said they were interested in our help. Mm -hmm. So go see what you can do. Yeah, go see what you can do. And then if you want to call them, 
you may turn that number into a paycheck. Yeah. And it may be as little as, yeah, we've already got the house picked out. We just need somebody to write the contract. Wow. This is going to be a great job. But that's not going to happen very often. <laughs> You're going to have to do things all the way, all the way down here. You're going to have to do everything. Pay all your expenses. You want to send postcards out? Broker's not writing a check for that or paying the postage. You're an independent contractor. You are a store. That's what you are. You're a little walking around store. You've got houses in your store and you've got buyers in your store. You've got knowledge in your store. But it's still your store. If you don't open the doors, then you're not going to do any business. So it's a hard thing to adjust to if you've been in the corporate world to adjust to this because nobody's calling you in the morning why aren't you at work yet you were supposed to be here at nine o'clock well my baby's sick today well you, your employer is going to say well you should have taken care of that yesterday <laughs> an independent contractor broker um, is going to say well, i'm sorry but is there anything we can do can we help? Can, can, I, can I call Michelle? She wants to babysit. Mm -hmm. She's not working today. Uh, this is um, right here. This is uh, something that you've got to pay attention to. If you've been in the corporate world and you've been getting a paycheck, there's lines on there that says deduction for F. See Just something, if I see it, FICA or mm -hmm. oh, some kind of initial, and a, a deduction for, for a Social Security tax, and a, a deduction for this tax and that tax, and oh, there's an Alabama tax, and you got a city tax too, all coming out of your paycheck without you ever seeing the money. That's better for a lot of people. If I don't see the money, I don't spend it. That's right. Independent contractor, you're getting a check for the gross amount. Now, you've got to keep up with your taxes, your expenses, and all this other stuff. It's up to you to file your taxes, and you'll have to pay those by the quarter. Once you've been in it like a year or so, and you've got a track record, you know what you're going to be making, they're going to want you to send them some money every quarter. And if you'll send them that little bit of money every quarter, then the next year when the taxes are due, you're not going to be hurting. Right. Where you get in trouble with this business is you won't put any money back for your taxes. And then April comes around and you say, oh, I think I'll get an extension because I don't have any money. And you get an extension to six months and you still don't have the money in six months. They say, you know, it's three years into this new job and you haven't paid a penny in taxes. They notice it. They will eventually find you and they'll call you and say, we've noticed you haven't filed any taxes in three years. What you been doing? You say, I've been sitting at home watching TV. I haven't done a thing. I promise. I, I promise. <laughs> It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> All right, so you got a, a, a little recap here. No set hours. Uh, not gonna tell you what to do, how to do it. They're gonna help you in every way to do it because it's in the broker's best interest for you to be productive. <laughs> if you're not making any sales, the broker's not making any override on you. A lot of companies, when you first go to work for them, they put you in a lower split because they got to spend so much time with you. Mm -hmm. You get in a team, then they're going to want to split. Well, you just got to figure out how you want to do the business. Because this is everything is going to be up to you. You're controlling it all. Going to be paid a commission. Now, um, occasionally you'll run across a situation to where there'll be an agent that's maybe got uh, two houses they want to hold open this weekend. And they'll say, hey, you doing anything Sunday afternoon? And you say, why? And they may say, I've got a house over here that hey, i got two I'm supposed to hold open this weekend. Can you hold one of them open for me? Well, I would say, absolutely. 
I'll be there because I want to catch a buyer or those nosy neighbors <laughs> yeah. because they're coming in to look too, too yeah. and they're looking at this house and well, you getting that much for it? What you think I can get for mine? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you're going to pick them up as a listing. Mm -hmm. That's why you're doing open houses. You're rarely going to sell that house at an open house. You're doing it to pick the people up. Oh, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've ever sold one at an open house, but you meet people. And a lot of them are those neighbors. For. Mm -hmm. Because so you just, the, you're generating some activity. Right. Basically. You've got to get people in your pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you met the neighbor, he came in there and said, Yeah, well, um, we're getting transferred to Wichita next June, and we're thinking about selling our house. Can you help us? Or you say, You need help? You, but you're there. Mm -hmm. You've got a name now. And then that name, you're going <coughs> to. Just crumble it up and not call him. No, you no, you can't. You got you got somebody there that needs you, so you're gonna stay on them, mm -hmm. and eventually you're gonna list their house. And then when you put theirs on the market, there's some more neighbors that come in. Mm -hmm. But the buyers that come in, they need you too. They're looking for a house in that neighborhood in that price range, or they wouldn't have walked in there. They're not just, mm -hmm. just going to go look at houses unless they're interested. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like car ads and furniture ads. You don't see them unless you're in the market for a right. car or furniture. Mm -hmm. House is the same way. <coughs> you're not going to go fool with them unless you're in the market. So that buyer that comes in and you meet, ah, I'm fixing a buy and I don't have an agent. Do I need an agent? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you why you need an agent. Uh, and then you give your value proposition to them. We kind of got off track here a little bit, but uh, we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, the benefit is you get a lot of freedom as an independent contractor. Some people cannot handle that freedom, and they never produce. Exactly. They will, yeah, they'll get their license, do all of this work, and mm -hmm. then get their license, and then I don't want to talk to anybody. What? Yeah, what if, what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Well, I'll get that answer for you. Just that's me. it. You can't be afraid. <laughs> and if you're afraid to talk to people in this business, you picked the wrong business. I ain't scared to talk. Now, here's the whole, whole thing right here. These two lines right here. It can be high paying hard work. It didn't say easy work. It can be high paying hard work. Because if you're making big money in this, I promise you, you're working hard. You're working long hours, uh, but the pay uh, will show it. Um, or it can be low paying easy work. Then you ain't getting no money. You're not doing your work. You're not doing any work. Okay, now, down the bottom it says the broker needs to know what you're doing. The broker's primary responsibility over you as a licensee is supervision. Yeah. Just need to know what you're doing. If you're doing anything, if you're not doing anything, don't need to know that. But if you're working on a deal, you need to have your broker in it. In fact, the first two or three deals you'll do, your broker's probably going to be looking over your shoulder, watching you. And you'll go through, in fact, when we do post license, um, we present contracts to each other. You'll present a contract to the seller, and you'll present it to a buyer, and you'll learn how to do this. Because once you've done it one time, it's easier the second time. And you're not as afraid. That's the biggest, I guess, uh, enemy in this is your confidence. Your confidence is your biggest enemy. And once you've got a success or two, you got a listing, you've shown it, you've made a sale, you've written a contract, you presented it, you got a check, and you say, this is okay. I can do this. I didn't have to unload a truck or anything. <laughs> but the broker's position is, in fact, my, my next, no, I got a slide in here somewhere with a broker with a magnifying glass. 
that's the broker's responsibility. Oh, it's oh, yeah, it's in the yeah. It is in there it's somewhere. Three more there. Um, mm -hmm. I got that. Uh, that's the bottom of the A, uh, A, A rank. Mm -hmm. Alabama Real Estate Commission. The rule says a broker must be in a position to supervise. Okay. Now here's the internal revenue. This is right off of their site. Got some more red lines here that's probably important. So as a general rule, is an individual, is an independent contractor, if the payer, that's the, the owner, the boss, the broker, whoever, uh, has the right to control or direct only the results of the work and not what will be done and how it will be done. That's an independent contractor. The broker will help you and advise you and you know, a lot of times, at uh, the first uh, listing someone does, I'll have them come in and I'm, I'll be the seller. And you present the listing presentation to me, and I'm going to ask you some softball questions. So you get used to them asking you questions. And then your confidence is up, <clears throat> but you're still on your own. You really don't want your broker going to your listing presentation with you. But if your confidence is that low, I'm going with you. I'll sit right there with you and let you do it. And if you stumble, we'll, we'll get you on through this. Um, the other one is, um, oh, I'm a self-employed. Here we go. A self-employed individual, generally, you're required to file your own taxes and estimate your quarterly taxes. Self-employed individuals generally must pay self-employment tax. That'll be uh, it's a separate form that you've probably never seen before that uh, you have to fill out and multiply by, I don't know, 16 point about 3% of whatever you made, and that's your, your self-employment tax. But then, once you start getting that Social Security check, <laughs> you say, I am so glad I filed that SE form. <laughs> yeah. Because if you don't put money into the Social Security account, mm -hmm. you're not getting any out. Yeah, right. yeah. I, it amazes me. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had an agent not long ago, well, several years ago now, she said, I don't want to make any money because I have to pay more taxes. Say what? That's crazy. <laughs> that is. That's, that's crazy. Um, Medicare tax, you're going to want that too, won't you? Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. Be, be mm -hmm. sure you pay that tax too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, due diligence. This is the one we want to look at. Because you have got. Do your homework. That's due diligence. There's a lot of things going on, and there's not an easy button on this. Remember that Staples commercial, the big red easy button? Uh, there's, there's not an easy button in this. There's things you've got to know, things you've got to do. Um, we've talked about insurance. Remember we talked about the clue report? Because a property, you sell somebody a, a house and they can't get insurance on it because it's been hit by lightning, got hit by a concrete truck, mm -hmm. uh, somebody fell off a roof, Ooh. you had a kitchen fire. Ooh. Well, insurance company, they, they have to report everything and they'll run a report on that property and I'm going to tell you, we do insurance here, and it's tough. Some people, some that you cannot get insurance on. And that's what you've got to do here. You've got seven days from contract date to make sure you can get insurance on the house. But let's carry that one step further. Um, I said one, I think it's Thursday night, we're going to talk about flood zones. Uh, <laughs> if you're in a flood zone, your insurance may double. Wow. Yeah. They may not give it to you. Uh, yeah, they won't give it to you. Mm -hmm. 
um, flood uh, if we were at the beach. If you're within, I don't know how many miles it is of the beach, you got to have hurricane insurance. Mm -hmm. As of about 10, 15 years ago, that's as much as your insurance too. So let's just say we live five miles from the beach. You have hazard insurance to protect the house from perils. Then you've got maybe flood insurance because everything down there is low next to a river. And then you got hurricane insurance. You may not be able to afford the insurance on this property. That's your due diligence as an agent to advise your clients, hey, you know, we're only three miles from the, from the ocean. We need to think about hurricane insurance. Well, they live here in Birmingham. They're just buying a house down there. They never thought about hurricane insurance. That's on you. So how would you, if you're a rookie, how would you know to, you know, to, I guess, Check forecast, it. you know, and know I better be advising them of X, Y, Z or whatever. Because we're doing it right now. <laughs> You're picking up a little piece here, a little piece. Every class we have done, you've picked up, I don't know, um, a couple hundred new pieces of information. Well, here's your new one tonight. You think all I got to do is call the insurance guy and say, hey, I need insurance on my new beach house. And wait a minute. You may not be able to afford the insurance on your new beach house. That's why, you get, that's why I say do your homework. Do your homework. Well, I had an aunt back in the 70s. They did a new subdivision out there in Pipe Shop, right there by um, Valley Creek. Mm -hmm. And it she, floods. She, she wasn't like the railroad track ran back here because she was like in the middle of the cul de sac. Uh -huh. And she was the one of the first of the three houses that was built in the cul de sac. Uh -huh. Okay, when it flooded, she took out the flood insurance in the beginning okay but then the other two people that had their houses built on the side of her they didn't I hear it. and then the one up here on this end then and the one on the front end didn't so after the third flood they tried to get insurance but they wouldn't give it to them because it was it was in a flood zone well whoever the the people was that built the houses down there my aunt was sort of like me Ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and she was asking because the creek were like uh, before you turn to go to her subdivision, go down like a half a mile. You got the little bridge, then you got the Valley Creek. So she was asking them, did it flood? Uh oh, and they said no. They said no, but she knew better because we lived up on top of the hill right after you go over the bridge. Uh -huh. So she already knew. Yeah. But that, that's the only reason why they didn't get the insurance because what they should have done was got the flood insurance when they first had their house built, like mm -hmm. she did. And the mortgage company, they're going to run a search. They're going to go to FEMA's site, and they're going to look. We're going to look at a map Thursday night, mm -hmm. um, and it shows you where it floods. Mm -hmm. And even if part of your property is in the flood zone, you got to insure the house. Man, when it floods down there, it gets up yeah. in the house. Yeah. Some of those houses, they right there up on top of the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like, and I'm not sure about flood insurance, but I know hurricane insurance. You can't buy it if there's a hurricane out there. <laughs> and you know, out on the beach, they have a lot of hurricanes. Yeah, you know it's coming. Yeah, so they ain't gonna get no insurance. Yeah, they might not. They can't even afford it. So they're do it's on you now because you're a professional. Yeah. And they're if you've got agency with them. You expected to advise them. You have to know everything about Yeah, that. you should know about insurance. Um, mortgage financing. In your contract, it says you've got seven days to apply for financing. Uh, as you're going through the contract with them, you don't want to just skip that paragraph. They need to know. Hey, you've got seven days to apply. Hopefully, after this class, you know that you, before you even write that offer, they've been to a mortgage company and applied and, and got a pre at least a pre-approval letter, even if they don't have a pre-qualifying letter, at least a pre-approval. Somebody said, okay, you can probably do this deal. That's on, you need to know those numbers 
And when you're talking to them and they say, well, my credit score is 500, we've been working on it for a while trying to get it up. Well, if they got a credit score of 500, there's not anybody, not even subprime now is 600 and, I mean 620 and below, they're gonna pay a higher rate in there. You can get a loan down to about 580. But below 580, you're probably not getting a loan. So if they come to you and say, well, my credit score is about 500, maybe 550, well, you probably need to send them on to a mortgage company that specializes in credit repair. Mm -hmm. And because they are things, I mean, they are simple things that people can do to get their credit up, you know, 50 or 100 points just by moving mm -hmm. liability and debt around. Uh, things simple as if you've got a car payment that's got less than 12 months on it, that won't count against your ratios. Mm -hmm. But you're talking to somebody and they owe 15 months on their car payment and it's $1,800 a month or $800 a month. Pay, three, yeah, pay, pay, it down, pay, pay a little of that now mm -hmm. and that will bring that ratio down and it also probably bring your credit rating up mm -hmm. because... You paid it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Figure out how much money. How much money do I have here to play with? How about this property inspection? You think that's important? Mm -hmm. Alabama, buyer beware state. It is seriously important here. The seller doesn't have to tell you anything if it's not health and safety related. And most of them don't even know that. And I said, no. Don't know anything about lead-based paint. Don't know anything about it. Um, they, they don't have to tell you things. So you need to know that the property inspection and what it's going to cover, what it's going to cost, who to call, and then if there are other things that are wrong with the property, like um, let's just say the, the home inspector came back and said, well, uh, this is 2019, I was looking at the HVAC and it was put in in 1987. <laughs> well, it's still working. Yeah, but it may be going out soon. I probably want to get an HVAC guy to go look at it and say, can we get another year or 10 out of this if we keep putting parts on it and doing things? Wow. you got to know this stuff. They're depending on you to give them this advice. How about a homeowners association? If they, you're looking at a subdivision there and you know there's an HOA, you think that's important? They, got, they can take your house. Yeah, if you don't pay the up. homeowners, and if you want to park your RV in the driveway, the rules may say you can't do, you can't that. do that. And you just say, I can too, it's my house. <laughs> and park it there, and then they start dinging you with fines. Yeah. You need to know how they work. I'm gonna have to learn how to do one step, jump back and forth on this. Mm -hmm. There are 14 year out there and show me how. It's probably a three year old. Uh, yeah, the three year olds can use an iPad better than I can. Mm -hmm. I know you can see us. No. Okay, we no, we're, we're oh, we're way back. Oh, 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 you, you just passed the man with that. There we go. Okay. That's your broker right there. That's his job. Reasonable supervision. <laughs> what is it reasonable? Uh, if you lived in Mobile, I'm probably not supervising you very well. Mm -hmm. But you're around here and we're talking and, mm -hmm. you know, every now and then you come by the office. Oh, y'all in a new office. No, same one we've been in for five years. <laughs> 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 it's been so long, don't you? <laughs> Ooh, that's funny. Yeah. 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 Now we're down to the antitrust laws, and again, we've covered some of this stuff already. Oh, sure. Was it the Sherman? Sure? Yes, we're going to talk about Sherman sure right here. 1890. I wonder if that was, is that the Sherman that burned down Atlanta? Oh, not that fool. That's not the one? Another Sherman. Okay, well, this one, 1890. Conspiracy or restraint of free trade. Uh, don't do anything that's going to restrain trade or hurt people, 
hurt your competitors by uh, false saying bad stuff about them, they can sue you for defamation. Yeah. Uh, if you wrote it down somewhere, it's liable. Uh, but uh, it's also a real estate uh, license law violation to, um, to really talk ugly about your competitors. They can, they can come at you for that. Good, that's called a goodwill of another uh, brokerage. All right, some of the things we got in antitrust. Price fixing. Price fixing is where we're all sitting around and saying, I can't make it on these 20% uh, residential commissions we're getting. I just, I just can't make it on that. And we said, well, how about if we raise it to 25%? Yeah, I could make it then. And y'all all chime in, or two of you chime in and say, okay, yeah, I'll go along with that. If you raise yours to 25%, I'll, I'll do it. All right, well, who's that hurting? The public. public. And y'all got to keep that in top of your mind. Our number one rule, protect, protect the, the public. public. And that's not protecting them. You can never say there's a standard or going rate. Don't even infer it. They're going to call you and say, well, what's the standard rate? What's the going rate here in Birmingham? Well, there is no going rate at our company. Our company charges based on the services we provide. We're going to do this and this and this and this for you and charge this much for it. No, I can't pay that much. Well, your broker may have set a minimum company policy that you can't take a listing for under 10%. And the seller you're talking to said, well, I'll only pay eight. You may not be able to take that listing. But your broker should have a policy saying you can negotiate because that's what the law says. You can negotiate. Your broker can say our company doesn't negotiate, but as long as that broker's not conspiring with other companies, to set that 10%, it's okay. Um, my thought is, if you want to work for free, try it out. See how it works for you. Yeah, you don't work. yeah try that out. You can work for free. Um, you've got to have enough to cover your expenses and your time. And uh, the, the new model that's kind of sweeping the country is discount brokerages to where they're going to come in and, and well, they'll we talked about the uh, guy from Miami. That he's got like 200 listings here in Birmingham. They're called minimum service flat fee listings. He'll take your listing, put it in the multiple listing service where the other agents can see it, and it feeds out to Zillow. So you're getting all the exposure. But he'll do that for $500. Oh my goodness. But that's all he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's still got some other responsibilities. Y'all remember what those are? He's got to. Yeah, he's got to do a recap form. In fact, he got fined uh, recently for not doing recap forms. Mm -hmm. What else are you supposed to do? Net sheet. Net sheet, and you must transmit the offers. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, he was responsible for that. Yes, that's a minimum service. You have to uh, transmit the offers. You have to do a net sheet with it. And you had to recap them to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, his listing agreement is not an agency agreement. You can do a non-agency listing agreement. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. But they're different models. I had an agent call me today. She said she had an offer from another company that um, they'd pay a 100% of her commission. She got to keep 100% of it. All she had to do was pay them $250 a month. Mm -hmm. I was sitting there for a minute. I said, that works for me. <laughs> I said, I'm not getting anything from you now. If you give me $250 a month, that's $3,000 a year. Uh, yeah, that's more than yeah, that's more than you're getting now. Uh, see, that's the kind of stuff that's that's happening. But from that broker, you're not getting anything. No help, no nothing, nothing. Uh, you're just going to pay them $250 a month to have your license there. Uh, I think and that's you get 100% of the commission, but at what cost? Yeah, at what cost? Uh, who, who are you going to call? <coughs> and, you know, once you know what you're doing, you could probably work with something like that. But in the beginning, that's not going to work. Uh, okay, we got price fixing. Boycotting. 
boycotting is this guy in uh, Miami. He's got 200 listings here. I uh, was well, to say when he took that listing from that uh, seller, he did the flat fee on that side. You think the seller wanted to know what's the minimum I can pay to a selling agent? Yeah, he probably they probably said, yeah, if I only got to pay you this, what's the minimum I can pay them to get them to bring a buyer in here? I well, I should say, negotiated down and said, well, how about two percent? Offer two percent out to the to the selling agencies to bring us a buyer. I, well, we're all sitting around, we're brokers, all sitting right here at lunch one day. He said, you know, there's a new guy coming into town only offering 2% selling commission. You know, if we won't show his properties, he'll have to bring those commissions up. Sound like boycotting? Mm -hmm. Don't do it. <laughs> Allocation of customers and markets. I, again, we're all brokers, and we're on every side of town. There's 20 miles between any of our offices. And we're sitting here having lunch I said, in Blount County and all that area up there. And that's where your office is. How about you and I have a little deal here to anything I get up that way, I'll give to you. Anything you get down here, you give to me. You have to give my license to it. And, and you're sitting there too, so well, my office is over in Leeds. Can I get a little piece of this? Because I don't want to go to up there or down there, either one. And then you chime in and say, well, I'm just, I'm between Birmingham and Tuscaloosa, and it's just a pain for me to go anywhere in Birmingham. Can I get in on this deal, too? Next thing you know, we got Birmingham chopped up. Who are we hurting? The public. The public, because what's going to happen is... Let's just say I'm a discount broker here. Yeah. And no, I'm not a discount broker. I'm a high price broker. Yeah. I'll only take listings for 10%. Oh. And now I've kind of pushed all my competitors out because you've given me, you've given me everything down here. So you gotta pay 10% here now. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna hurt the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um Got that. Restrictions on competition. Uh, this, uh, I think, is um, more on like shopping centers. Gotcha. Um, Commercial. If you're, yeah, if you're a, a managing a shopping center and you know, you've got a candy store and then um, all the rest of the buildings are empty. I just finally rented one and it's a candy store. Next thing you, you call me up and say, I'm looking for a place for a candy store. I can't say you can't move into the shopping center because we've already got a candy store there. Mm -hmm. That's not my decision. They need to fight that out. Mm -hmm. Competitive, one's got better candy or lower price or something. That's not my decision mm -hmm. to say y'all can't do that. Tie-in agreements, that is where you say, okay, um, our company is... Uh, one stop, one shop, full service. We do everything. We do brokerage, we do mortgages, we do title insurance, we do closings. Appraisals. We do appraisals and we wash cars on the weekend. <laughs> Let's show them out and keep on coming. <laughs> um, we do it all. Yeah, we do. And if you want to do business with us as a brokerage, you're going to have to use our mortgage company. And that means you're going to use our title company, our attorney. You got to use it all. Everything. If you want to use one part of it, you, you got to use, use it all. all. Wow. That's a tie-in agreement. Yeah, I I mentioned spam it. earlier. Found a picture of a can of spam. That'd be good for that. Uh, I didn't know what can spam meant. Uh, they threw that law out there. Said you got to be you know, watching the can spam. <laughs> Uh, so what is that? Uh, uh, it's spam. <laughs> uh, but actually, the, 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 that's an acronym. Controlling Assault from Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act. 
I don't know that I've ever had any unsolicited pornography show up on my screen or in my email or anywhere else. Is that really a problem? Apparently it was. They came up with a law to where if you're going to send somebody some pornography through a, through <laughs> you your email, ask for it. They, they really got to ask for it. You've got to uh, first. You can't say, well, this is a picture of uh, Pam and it's spam and it's really Pam, but <laughs> uh, it can't be misleading or lies. Got to be on your advertising. Remember, and this everything you send out pretty much is advertising. Uh, most of your emails going to be some kind of advertising. You're servicing or something. Uh, can't be deceptive. You've got to identify it as an advertisement. You've got to give them an opt out. It's got to. Y'all seen these? It'll be down at the bottom and say to unsubscribe. Uh, click here. You got to have that on there. Uh, click that, and it's uh, they've got ten days to get you off the list. And if they s keep sending you stuff pictures of Pam and a little can, and you didn't want any more pictures of Pam and a can, uh, you can be in a lot of trouble. I think the fine's the same as the other one. I think it's eleven thousand. I think it's eleven thousand dollars for that. Well, can and spam. Yeah, for getting the can spam <laughs> and not letting them uh, say no. I don't want. I don't want any more of the spam. It's just nasty stuff. <laughs> the rules are similar for unsolicited fax as well. Uh, used to be everybody used fax machines. We've got one. It's built into the printer, and occasionally a fax will come through it, but you rarely get these anymore. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that one we had a minute ago with uh, MySpace. Um, gotcha. We, yeah. kinda, we keep moving on, but the laws still will cover. Uh, the three, yeah, the, all honest and all that. <laughs> all right, this one I wanted to show you because this is something that. Um, 